the greatest guy for you. Well, for the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to be talking about this entity of oxytocin. And just as a show of hands, can I see how many people use three units of oxytocin or less for cesarean deliveries? Okay. And how many use like between three and 20 units? Um, 20 and 40 units? Okay, and how about more than 40 units? Okay, kind of like an auction here. You know, I'm trying to see who the highest bidder is. But it is a drug that we use so frequently on labor and delivery, and yet we use it so cavalierly, and maybe we should pay just a little bit more attention to it. Today, we're just gonna talk a little bit about the drug, how it works, how it should work for us, and what ways that perhaps we can manipulate the drug as we go on on our daily activities. Now, we're between the proverbial rock and the hard space. And the rock certainly is the fact that a lot of obstetricians demand that we use a certain amount of the drug. You know, sometimes they'll say 40, you put in 40, it's not giving them what they need, they say 80, 80, 160, 160, 320. It's truly that escalating ping pong auction year store style. But the hard place is now looking at the evidence that's accumulating. Money, much of it has been done by obstetric anesthetists and anesthesia providers and reconciling that information with what we do clinically. So we're going to follow the, the famous Belgian cartoonist um, and his character Tintin or Tantan in the French speaking world, always accompanied by his dog Snowy. And like any good investigative reporter, we're going to launch a theory about oxytocin use. We're going to conduct our own investigation. And finally, we're going to come out with a news flash at the end. So, tin tin. Now, you guys are probably all doodling things on your iPads and on your pads of paper in front of you, probably, you know, sketching out this compound right here. <laughs> <laughs> and I applaud you for that. Um, this is oxytocin. And it's a drug that's been symbolized by a couple different awards. In 1909, Henry Dale, the first individual to isolate this, uh, was knighted by the Queen of England. And he later, in 1936, won the Nobel Prize for this discovery. He didn't know much about oxytocin at the time, except that it was secreted by the posterior pituitary, that it had some relationship with labor and delivery, but wasn't really clear about that. It wasn't until 1953, American biochemist Vincent du Vignaud was able to synthesize this compound. Now, Vignot said it's an octopeptide instead of the parent nona peptide, saying eight peptides or protein chains versus nine. I would disagree with him. He, he said the two cysteines are complexed together by a disulfurous bond. It's a very strong bond. So in an entity, it works together like one single protein. Um, I disagree with him, but in 1955, he won the Nobel Prize for this synthesis, um, so he gets some naming rights. But I want it to be made completely clear that the synthetic version and the natural versions are absolutely the same. Okay? And with his discovery and with his synthesis, we were able to utilize it, understand it a little bit better, and with that came an understanding that we could augment and induce labor. There are a number of receptors for oxytocin scattered throughout the body. While we focus on the ones that are in the uterus, there's also ones in the heart, which will become relevant later on as we discuss this, but also in the CNS. Um, and the CNS are vitally important to the whole labor process too. Being unpolitically correct, we have all seen babies that are, you know, we peek over the bassinet and we say, whoa, <laughs> Like, they are probably the best looking babies you've seen. I mean, admit it, admit it, right? And, and you think, this is truly a face that only a mother could love. <laughs> and oxytocin levels high in the mother definitely creates this relationship, and it's also called the love hormone, and a lot of people have studied it in relationship coupling, that if you see someone maybe sitting next to you or in a table close by that you think is is handsome or beautiful, you, you get a little spike of oxytocin. And there is something about oxytocin and the relationship it has with um, our moods, our emotions, and certainly how we feel about different individuals. There's also an oxytinose, uh, oxytinase that breaks down. It's an enzyme that breaks down oxytocin. And the effective half-life of oxytocin is short, roughly about three minutes, all the way up maybe to nine minutes, but very short agent 
Now, I don't want to recall completely back to all of our nursing and medical studies, but to focus just a little bit on the receptor, um, it is known to increase over the course of, of gestation. So you get sequential increases at about 20th week, the 30th week, and then at term. And teleologically, this makes a great deal of sense. You want the uterus to be very irritable when it comes time to full term so you can express the baby. There's four mechanisms of action of how that complexing of oxytocin to its receptor works, mostly through the transflux of calcium and the augmentation of prostaglandins. Now, looking at this receptor a little bit more closely, we also recognize that there's a negative feedback loop. That if you complex oxytocin to its receptor over a period of time, that you'll actually get involution and desensitization of that receptor. In looking at the studies that have been done in this vein, Joyce did the interesting in some of the first rat studies where they showed that if you expose a rat oxytocin receptor to oxytocin within one hour, you get diminution of function. And Fainuf did probably the most interesting human study where they demonstrated that if you expose the receptor to four hours of oxytocin, that you get a 50% reduction in calcium flux through that cell. And at six hours, you get no calcium flux through that cell. So effectively, that oxytocin receptor is no longer contributing to the contractile force of the uterus. So with this, we come up with three theories. First, that oxytocin is overdosed. Secondarily, that this overdose actually causes harm. And third, that there's an alternate plan available. So we pose this first question in asking how much oxytocin should we use and what is the guidance relating to the use of oxytocin. And I must say, the most restrictive evidence comes from Chestnut's um, obstetric anesthesia textbook. It may have something to do with the guy who wrote the chapter on cesarean delivery, last name Sen, may have something to do with the editor of textbook, a uh, guy named Sen, but I will say that it's very evidence-based, okay? And it's a reflection of the literature and, and what we know about the drug in this contemporary forum. Snarin and Levinson still says you can give a wide range, 20 to 40 units. If we look at what our obstetric colleagues are using and what guidance they receive, the three leading textbooks in their field, Gabby's obstetric says you can use that wide range of 20 to 40 units. Danforth just says that you can use oxytocin. And Williams, the granddaddy of them all, just the newest edition, 2014, just says you should use oxytocin. Gives no guidance in terms of dose, uh, how rapidly you should give it, how frequently you should give it. It's pretty amazing that it's a very generalist attitude to the dosing of oxytocin. So many obstetricians and obstetric providers turn to their societies. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists says you can use 10 to 40 units. Society up in Canada says a slightly reduced amount, 5 to 20 units, and introduces this idea that you can use carbitocin. We'll talk about carbitocin in just a little bit, but carbitocin is oxytocin analog. I don't think it's ready for prime time. I know why it got inserted into the society guidelines of the Canada. There was a, a leading investigator of carbitocin, and he sort of inserted it into their guidelines. I, it's not FDA approved. It's not ready for prime time. A lot more evidence needs to be collected on carbitocin before we feel comfortable in its use. British National formally has probably the most restrictive guidelines. And that's in part due to the fact that with 10 units of oxytocin, there have been a couple maternal deaths reported in the UK, given as a single IV bolus. And by and large, most practitioners, both on the anesthesia side as well as the obstetrician side, subscribe to this, that they give less than five units for cesarean delivery. Now, the convicts and the hobbits, Australia and New Zealand, you know, they. The reason why they're in Australia and New Zealand is they don't want to listen to the British Crown. Um, <laughs> they still are using about 10 units, but I think if we were to resurvey them, maybe in a couple of years, we'd also see their adoption to smaller amounts of oxytocin. Okay? So we can conclude by saying that the oxytocin guidelines are very empiric and very vague. Now, I think some of this vagueness actually comes in how our obstetric colleagues talk about the drug. On our labor floor, we'll oftentimes hear for augmentation and induction, the, the residents, but also the faculty and the midwives say, start with 0.5 units of PIT and go to a max dose of 30 units. Uh, perhaps you've heard similar conversations on your labor floor. 
what they're actually meaning is start with 0.5 milli international units per minute and go to a maximum of 20 milli international units if it's a, a multiparous patient or someone with a scarred uterus. Or you can go up to 30 milli international units per minute if it's someone that is a primiparous patient, no prior scars on the uterus. Now, if you just take those amounts of drug and you look at how long it will take you to reach just five units of oxygen, you'll see that with the higher dose, 30 milli, milli international units per minute, it'll take you about three hours. And if you're using that smaller dose, it'll take you about seven days. And it's this nomenclature use, this familiarity, this statement that we're using 0.5 units and not 0.5 milli international units, this thousandfold difference that oftentimes changes the complexion of how our obstetric colleagues think about the drug. They feel it's like something similar to holy water, um, always good and more is better, right? Um, but that may not be the case. And so we pose the question, how much oxytocin do you actually need? Mukesh Sarna, Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, did one of the first studies, looked at uh, five units versus other uh, five, 10, 15, 20, and found a ceiling effect after five units. But I think the better studies have been done at University of Toronto. Jose Carvalho and Marino Balki demonstrated that if you have someone that's roughly on augmentation or induction of 10 units uh, or 10 hours of oxytocin, you take them to cesarean delivery, that you only need three units of oxytocin. And in the group that has not been exposed to oxytocin previously, so coming in for elective cesarean delivery, just doing oxytocin for that group, they did the up-down sequential allocation method, just needed one-ninth amount, so 0.35 units of oxytocin for the entire case. And this compares also to Alex Butwit group, uh, Alex and, and uh, the Stanford group, indicated that if you use zero units of oxytocin, and this was a study that we had wanted to do at our own institution, in over half the amount of time, you need to know further oxytocin. So it's pretty amazing that we're using these high amounts of oxytocin, and yet we don't really need to. And these three facts, in terms of its cause of harm or relationship with harm, may surprise you, but they're all true, both in the literature as well as the legal documents. Um, and oxytocin is just one of 13 drugs on this list of high alert medications. And that includes agents that we only give at time of ACLS, includes chemotherapeutic agents. Another example is insulin. And you know how carefully we draw up insulin. We have a little tuberculin, you know, tuberculin syringe, we draw up 0.1 cc's, and we're very cautious about how we give it, when we give it, and where we give it. And yet, we're giving oxytocin so rapidly, so cavalierly, we're doubling up, tripling, quadrupling up the doses sometimes. So taking a look at the harm that we observe on a frequent basis, one that we see is association with hypotension. And Alex's study also demonstrates what seems to be a dose relationship with oxytocin and the amount of hypotension that you observe. Now, there's a couple mechanisms for this sort of entity, this association. And one of them has a direct relationship with oxytocin complexing to the cardiac receptors for oxytocin. And that causes negative inotropy and negative chronotropy. Moreover, when you give oxytocin, you release atrial natriuretic peptide and nitric oxide, which reduces inotropy as well as causes vasodilatation. And finally, a side effect is chlorbutanol is a preservative used in some formulations of oxytocin. And that in and of itself causes negative inotropy and decreases in vasodilatation, or increases in vasodilatation. And overall, this effect is sometimes a great decrease in heart rate, as well as sometimes blood pressure, absolutely blood pressure, to the extent where you can oftentimes cause cardiovascular collapse. And that's what was reported in, in those cases in the UK. Eldred Lantisker in Oslo, Norway, did an interesting study where they uh, wanted to observe this hypotension. So they put arterial lines in their group of study patients. And if you define hypotension, like most of us do for studies, as a decrease by 20% in your systolic blood pressure, then 100% of these women observed hypotension. 
okay? Because the minimum was 27%, the maximum 35%, average of 31%. And in the 20 group, 20 patients that received a second dose of oxytocin, once again, 100% of these women received hypotension. Because uh, the minimum was, again, 20%, maximum 27%, and a mean of 23%. Tom Archer has done some studies with a similar device, also looked at peripheral vascular resistance and indicated that you get hypotension mostly by this reduction in peripheral vascular resistance. So this is something that we should be aware of, something that we have observed, and something that we should do something about. We're also concerned about oxygen's effect on free water clearance, its possibilities for myocardial ischemia, but also the complaints that we see and what patients report. We sometimes see that flushing after we start the oxytocin. Uh, we sometimes see the nausea and vomiting. We oftentimes ascribe that to the fact that they're pulling on the uterus. But these are the same effects that they observe in the UK where they don't exteriorize the uterus, leave it in situ. So it's not just manipulation of the uterus that causes these symptoms. But I'll tell you what I'm most concerned about is its effects on uterine tone. And more specifically, the more we use oxytocin, the higher degrees of uterine apnea and also blood loss. And if you look at some of the studies that are now coming out, looking at augmentation and induction. And in those groups that received higher amounts of oxytocin for the process of labor, that in the end, at delivery, either vaginal or cesarean, they had higher amounts of blood loss, in part because uterine apnea was such a relevant entity, and in part that's because the oxytocin receptor has desensitized and no longer is helping you. Okay. So what do we need? Our newsflash is that we need a new way of delivering oxytocin that pays homage to the fact that the receptor is affected by oxytocin that's being given, the fact that we can incorporate alternate agents into the algorithm, and the fact that we understand both the risks and benefits of its use. And we've come up with what we call the rule of threes. And I did this in conjunction with Marina Albalki at the University of Toronto, in part because she's done a lot of the basic science lab work around this, and we've engaged in a lot of different lab work, but also clinical work as well. And the three units pays homage to either in the elective or non-elective situation. So either someone who has already been exposed to oxytocin versus not, the three units will work for both these populations. Um, and I just wanted something that was very simple to remember. So three units. The three-minute interval gives homage to the half-life of oxytocin, and the three units per hour maintenance dose pays homage to many of the obstetric literature evidence that after vaginal delivery or cesarean delivery, that it's nice to have a small amount of oxytocin that's being continuously infused to maintain urine tone. Now, the three pharmacologic options are, are ones that we know and consider very carefully. But the reason why we need to think about this is, you know, we've all had obstetricians where you start oxytocin and just 30 seconds later they're asking for methogen or hemovate or you know saying that the sky is falling and we, got, <laughs> we have to do something about it, right? Um, and we incorporate this in, in a way and I'll show you the algorithm in just a little bit, but methogen, hemovate, and also uh, cytotec, these are all agents that we can utilize. The methogen being an ergot alkaloid, a, a supreme vasoconstrictor, is someone that you have to worry about, is a drug you have to worry about if you have preeclampsia or gestational hypertension. The hemabate being a prostagan releaser, you have to have some concerns when you give it to asthmatic patients. And the cytotec, interestingly, and this is the one off-label use that I'm talking about, it's approved to reduce gastric ulcers from non-steroidals. But we're using it certainly to help augment urine tone. There's a big global study going on right now that should hopefully report maybe this year or next year, um, watching its effects on postpartum hemorrhage rates in especially lower resource countries. And if that works out, it'll be fantastic because uh, methogen and hemabate are both heat sensitive. They come in glass ampules. They're kind of hard to carry and transport, whereas Cytotec comes in that little pill that's very heat insensitive and you can use it in all different types of environments. But looking at the use of these alternate agents, uh, Brian Bateman and I took a look, and Alex also, um, 
took a look at over two million deliveries, and this accounts for one-fifth of all deliveries in the United States. And we found that oftentimes the rates of use of these alternate agents was very diverse. I mean, in some places, only 2% of the time you'd be using these agents, whereas in other hospitals and institutions, 25% of the time you would be using these agents. Now, that wide range cannot be true. It, it really reflects just what is the convening practice at that institution. And we need to create more science on the effective and appropriate use of these agents um, when we come time for cesarean delivery and vaginal delivery. But we do know that oxytocin and methogen, because they work in different mechanisms, do work better together, but you don't necessarily need to move to methogen in many points in time. That hemobate is less effective than methogen. And with carbitocin, I, I think that's something that we need to think about in the future. It does have a certainly longer half-life, but some of Renal Balki's work that's coming out of the lab right now show that it's significantly less potent than oxytocin. And where to place it in this whole algorithm, I think we need to think about that. We need to do more research on it. And once again, it's not FDA approved for use in the United States. So what does the rule of threes look like? And how do you actively engage this in clinical practice? Three units of oxytocin, dose it over 30 seconds. You wait three minutes. You do a timed inquiry at three minutes. You say, do we have good tone? If it's adequate, you put them on a maintenance dose. Inadequacy leads to a second dose. Adequate tone at six minutes now places them on the infusion. If it's inadequate, you give the third and final dose of oxytocin. If that restores you to adequacy, you put on the maintenance dose. But if not, then you invoke the other agents. So this is a, a really complete and rational way to think about the science of the drug itself and place it in perspective of what this drug, as well as other drugs, can do. It relates the other drugs, the alternative agents, to a later point in time. So people aren't asking for them right away because the side effects will be invoked by them. And it really prevents sort of a rational plan for use. And we've actually studied this. We just published a study in anesthesiology. Uh, I know the, the figure is a little bit small, but it's the same algorithm that I just pre presented in the slide previous. And what we demonstrated was this works. And what we were using at the time was uh, we had a dummy bag of just saline, but it was labeled oxytocin. And we just kept that free flowing. And that just made everybody comfortable in the room <laughs> where we were just using three unit bolus of oxytocin. And they were completely comfortable with the tone and everything else. And we ended up with every cesarean delivery only using four units or less by the time we hit the door going back to the labor floor. So um, it's a therapy that works. And it's a therapy that we've actually shared with a lot of big health groups. Um, Mayo Health Group, and Katie can talk about that. But also Sheridan Health Group, Kaiser Health Groups here in California, um, both Northern and Southern Cal, and Michael Roscoe and some back can talk about that. Um, and we're, we're in discussions now with Hospital Corporation of America. So hopefully we'll see this rolled out into more and more practices that, and demonstrate that effective to you. There are some different commercial sort of applications or concentrations of oxytocin available, and these are amounts that you need to use. But in looking at this and summarizing what our points are of oxytocin, we pose the initial question, is oxytocin overdose? And our response to that, based on the literature, the science, what we know about the drug and the pharmacokinetics, is it's absolutely overdose. And this overdose can invoke harm, including cardiovascular collapse. And so the news flash is that we should utilize our rule of threes, use a very focused, smaller amount of oxytocin, do the timed interval question at three minutes, six minutes, nine minutes, what's the uterine tone look like? And then decide whether or not you want to introduce those alternative agents. So the rock is still out there. We need to change a lot of behavior, especially that of our obstetric colleagues. But we can do this with some persistence as well as some educational efforts on our end. Um, and I'm looking forward to your questions on this. And I also invite you, this is my last presentation, to the other SOAP-related meetings that we have going on for the remainder of this year. Um, the SOAP conference is coming back after 25 years to Boston. 
So I really invite you to that. We have a, a bunch of historical anecdotes and, and a tour set up that you get to see the cemetery where a lot of these luminaries are buried, the ether dome and a lot of other things. Um, it's going to be a great time. We have a, a, an East Coast clinical meeting similar to the Saul Schneider here. And then finally, the Saul Schneider next year. Hopefully, we'll see you again next year. But thank you very much for your attention and your interest. Thank you.